Yeah. So, um, interesting question. So on, the, on, on the Sunday night uh, meetings, we had a little bit of discussion whether this actually constitutes radio astronomy. Uh, certainly in the UK, in the, the, the uh, British Astronomical Association Radio Astronomy Group, uh, do feel it does. So we've uh, incorporated that as part of our um, uh, our activities, including the UK Radio Astronomy Association uh, producing either a kit or a ready-made detector, which is what I've been using uh, to do this. Um, but uh, I appreciate different people have different views. But certainly it's something which you might, whether or not you see it as pure radio astronomy or not, it's certainly something that might broaden your horizons again and take you outside of uh, the normal things that you do and into a, perhaps another interesting and excitingly different thing to look at. And, and, and this is to basically detect uh, muons uh, from your own house or one of the way detecting cosmic rays because they're the results of, of muons. Or as I put here, building your own version of the Large Hadron Collider in your study. Um, and you'll find out in a minute what the advantage of having a banana uh, in your radio astronomy kit is. Uh, this picture comes from the Cosmic Watch website, uh, which is from MIT. And uh, a lot of the pictures I've used today are actually produced, reproduced with their very kind permission. Uh, and actually, the whole program for this was uh, was actually produced by them originally. Although I know that other people have produced other things. You go on YouTube and you can find various uh, various videos on how to produce different types of muon detectors. Uh, but uh, this is one that's now readily available. Um, and uh, as you can see, that guy holding his hand, very small, very convenient, fits into any flat uh, does not affected by radio interference and uh, basically is uh, pretty exciting to get involved in again. So uh, uh, hopefully I can take you for a little bit of a, a roller coaster ride and uh, yeah, hopefully enjoy it. If I get to change the slide. There we are. So uh, I don't know um, what you guys feel. I just hear you do have a little bit of hail and stuff there. Again, in the UK, we're getting a significant problem with. Uh, with cloud, uh, bad enough for the light pollution, the house is being built, but we're also getting, as, as global warming affects us, uh, we're also getting uh, worse problems with cloudy nights. Uh, so we're not able to get out there and see things. And there's an awful lot of very expensive kit hanging around, not doing very much. In fact, uh, I would suggest that uh, um, the average astrophotographer might be paying uh, 500 pound to a thousand pounds per picture that they're producing at the moment, which doesn't seem like a very good deal. Right, so at the moment we talked about before in my last talk about uh, producing uh, producing aerials, or as you guys call them, antennae. Um, and uh, that's all fine, but what happens if you've got a little flat uh, and you can't fit one outside in your garden, Then, uh, or just want something a bit different that uh, fits around everything else that you're doing? It would be great to have something quite small, as I said to you, and again, this is what we're going to get. And it is relatively cheap. I mean, cheap, obviously, is, is comparative, but I would say uh, relatively cheap astronomy terms. It's, it's less than the price of many Teleview eyepieces uh, uh, or, or radio kit that you've got um, and give you something completely different to, to look at. Um, that's what I just said. Uh, I only live around the corner from a big supermarket and we've got loads of radio interference, as I mentioned before. So although this uses a small detector, uh, it also makes use of the fact that above our heads, we've got about 20 kilometers of atmosphere that we can use. And so actually that 20 kilometers of atmosphere is what is work acting as the the, the natural uh, Large Hadron Collider, colliding uh, cosmic uh, rays with uh, molecules in the atmosphere and producing cascades of secondary particles that we can then detect from our, our own detector here on the Earth. Again, teaching you to suck eggs, I am sure. But just a reminder that uh, um, cosmic rays, most of them come from the sun, but we do have a few that come from outer space, which can be very powerful. And it's both these types of cosmic rays that we're going to be detecting with this detector here. So in this graphic, it gives you an idea of uh, the secondary particle creation. So we've got one coming in from from. Uh, out to space or wherever, whether it's solar or extra galactic. Um, and as it comes in, it cascades against uh, particles in the atmosphere and you get the production of secondary particles here, some pions decaying into various things. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, 
we get all sorts of things, but in particular, we get muons, which are particles about uh, charged particles about 200 times the size or 200 times the mass of a mic of a, an electron. And these uh, then reach uh, um, ground level and can be detected. Um, cloud chamber on the left hand side showing a muon uh, a muon ray passing through it on the right hand side again just to take a, a decay uh, pathway and here what we've got is, is some of the interesting thing about muons so um you can see here again between dose at the top of the atmosphere but uh, also one of the most interesting things about them is that they have a very short lifespan of only about two millionths of a second which is very interesting in itself because there isn't enough time for the muon to get from 20 kilometers up down to the the ground for us to detect it before it decays from that two minutes of a second um which is weird because we actually can detect them so so what's the answer to that and the answer is einstein's special theory of relativity these muons are traveling at close to the speed of life and as a result at those speeds time passes more slowly for the muon than it does for us so what takes longer than two millionths of a second for us is actually less than two millionths of a second for the muon itself. And so therefore, detecting muons isn't just an interesting way of detecting secondary particles from cosmic rays. It's also a way of demonstrating Einstein's special theory of relativity. So in the last uh, talk, I was able to say that we were able to use our radio astronomy probe experiments to demonstrate dark matter. And here we're now demonstrating Einstein's special theory of relativity. I don't know about you, but if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what does. Uh, and I mentioned the Cosmic Ray Watch program. They also produce a bit like uh, the SARA Scope in the Box project produces an excellent uh, series of ready-made software. Uh, similarly here from Cosmic Watch, they also produce a, a ready-made series of, uh, of software which works with an Arduino um, to allow you to do to detect these muons uh, in this detector. Um, and they provide plans on that Cosmic Watch website for you to be able to make it yourself. Um, so if you fancy doing it, uh, you can actually go out and source your own um, uh, your own components. There is some difficulty with that. I, I was looking on eBay the other day, and somebody was selling one of the scintillators that go goes with this as a plastic scintillator that goes in it. Um, and they wanted about $130 for it, which seems rather expensive for just one of the components. Whereas Cosmic Watch tried to make out you can do the whole thing for less than $100. So I think for most of us, it would be quite difficult to source the components for that price. However, I would say now there are some sources that are coming out with the, there are kits being provided with all the components. And in particular, the UK Radio Astronomy Association do, now provides a kit with all the components ready put together for you. And you can make your own detector. Um, in a minute, we'll talk about something called coincidence. But basically, just bear in mind that ideally you have, you don't need to, but uh, ideally you have two of these uh, detectors, which you'll see in a minute, but you don't actually need to. And, and so that I just want to just emphasize that I'm not mentioning the UK Radio Astronomy Association. Uh, I have no personal involvement in it, and it is a, a registered charity, not a profit company in the UK. So um, uh, they're not making any profit out of it. They just provide it. In fact, most of the, the work they do is just done by volunteers. But there are alternatives. Um, I, I just looking online, I discovered this muon pie project. I, I don't know much else, else about it, but they actually provide detectors. I believe they provide them free of charge if you can persuade them to allow you to, to, to host a detector and they support it. Um, this one you can actually buy muon physics, it costs you a small fortune, but there are some, some more expensive ones that are available for purchase. And there's even some here that, uh, are supposed to use your smartphone to, to help detect muons. I don't know how they work. And again, I don't know much about them, but uh, I did come across these just to show that there are other alternative options. And again, some of the people on SARA and elsewhere have been detecting muons doing other mechanisms. So uh, there are alternatives. But it's going back to the Cosmic Watch detector or the UK ARA detector. So it's based basically on a, on a plastic scintillator, which is a bit of doped plastic. Uh, I don't know what they dope it with, but... Uh, Doping means you add in a few extra atoms, which allow uh, electrons and things to move. And in this case, it allows it to start producing a nice little flash of light for you. And then you have a um, a photo uh, detector, which is on a chip, the SIPM, which uh, then detects the flash of light. 
Uh, it, it's got to be uh, completely optically isolated. So they use some really posh optical isolation systems, which basically means uh, wrap it all up in silver foil and then tape it with a load of electrical insulating tape. But it works nevertheless and shove it in a box. I mentioned coincidence. So this is what we call them, the master slave configuration. So muons are being produced uh, all the time from well, coming down from space, uh, roughly at around about uh, one a second. Um, but apart from that, you also get a lot of the muons that have been produced on Earth that uh, come out of radioactive decay from rocks around us. So if you just got one detector, you can use that, uh, but you won't actually know for sure whether that's coming from uh, the muons come from around you or from space, although you could argue that if it's kept in, in one position, that uh, probably the background radiation from the ground uh, is roughly the same all the time. So you, you could assume that and just use the difference as occurs over time. But another way of doing it is to actually use two of these detectors, one on top of each other, and then only to count the detections where both detectors pick it up at the same time or within uh, they're using within 30 milliseconds of each other. Uh, and that what gets rid of the ones coming from the sides and helps you to just pick up those that are coming from space. So that's called coincidence or the master slave configuration. Uh, and this and the Cosmic Watch program allows you to set up two in that way. So this bit of video, I hope it's working. Is the video working? Do you see it flashing away? Dave, can you see it flashing away? Yeah, we see it. Yeah, so 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 this is uh, my two detectors uh, detecting. You see, there's an M at the top for master and uh, an S at the bottom for slave. And if you look at the counts that are on there, you can see that uh, we've got up to uh, this has just been starting. You can see we've got 140, 170, 118 at the top, but the bottom's only recording about nine. So that's the number that have been recorded, um, which have actually gone through both detectors at the same time. Now. The Cosmic Watch uh, software that's provided uh, provides with everything you need to get started. You don't need to do anything else. And in particular, through their website, you can actually have a live charting of the uh, detections as they occur. And, and, and this is what's happening here. So at the top there, you can see the detections as they come through. And then the graphs uh, lower down are actually starting to summate and graph those detections over time. And then you can download the data. Alternatively, you can just save the data directly to your computer and do your own analysis, whichever you prefer. So what do you do with these muon detectors once you've got them? Uh, there are various things you can do to demonstrate bits of science. So here, um, I can't say I've done this myself, but uh, the cosmic, if I take it from the Cosmic Wedge website, to just show some of the data that they present. Here, what they've done is uh, measured um, detection rates at different heights uh, on different locations around the world at, um, and looked at the count rate and shown very clearly that uh, the higher the altitude, the higher the rate. In other words, demonstrating further that the, the muons are uh, you know, coming from space and the closer you go up, the further you go up in the atmosphere, the more that you'll be able to pick up. Interestingly, um, they've also demonstrated that if you go down below ground, you get the opposite effect. This is from my date. LRO stands for Litchwood Radio Astronomy, Radio Observatory. I think if you're going to do something like this, you may as well have a fancy name for your observatory, even if it's a bit over the top. So I call it Litchfield Radio Observatory. So this is actually my attempt to measure the data over, over 24 hours. Now, some of the data on the line suggests that there is a variance over a 24-hour program. This is over several days, as you can see. And the most obvious thing you can see with these detectors is I've not been able to see a real demonstration between day and night. And I guess that means I just don't have the sensitivity to do it with this type of detector. But one thing that you can do is get a radioactive source and show the effect of that. And as, as that decays, then the, uh, the detector will start to pick up uh, flashes from that. It, it will detect uh, things other than just muons, uh, especially if they're close by. So here, as uranium rocks being stuck on the top of it, and then moved further away from again from the uh, the Cosmic Watch program. Um, here, what I've done is, this is my data now, and what I've done here is actually, I've got coincidence mode, so what that's done is, is cut out the, the muons coming from the side, um, but then what I've done is put lead underneath, uh, various amounts of lead underneath the detectors to try and get rid of stuff coming through the bottom, 
to see what the effect is. And you can see there that uh, um, a certain number of centimetres of lead at the bottom, you can see slowly it, it drops off the count on the left-hand side. And here it is where the banana comes in. So my bananas I'm using as a as a new unit of radioactivity. You know, bananas are quite radioactive. So uh, uh, there's my data showing uh, numbers of banana units at the bottom versus counts on the left hand side, showing that uh, that the number of counts goes up with the number of bananas. It's really important to put the book between the bananas and the muon detectors in order to uh, balance the bananas rather than doing anything else. You can then eat the bananas afterwards to prove they were bananas to ensure that you get a good experimental process. Now, this is the next thing I've been trying to do because um, uh, the only problem with, uh, with, with doing this, uh, this muon detection is that although it's great um, for outreach activities, you know, actually you need something to actually see. So the next thing I've been trying to do is actually create a cloud chamber to go alongside it. So I, which will actually take me on traces. I've actually been remarkably unsuccessful so far. Uh, I understand some other people with similar problems. There's anybody out there who's good at making cloud chambers and can tell me exactly what to do. It would be greatly appreciated. But here we are. This is what I'm hoping to do anyway. So it's an example of something creating a cloud chamber. Um, and this is me attempting to make one. Um, the uh, stuff at the left-hand side at the top is a, a, a large... Um, computer heat sink thing uh, which are then filled up with uh, some sort of uh, uh, cool jelly solution which you use for uh, putting on people's joints and you can put it in the, the freezer take it down to minus 20 degrees the idea is that you put something very cold under the bottom of the container uh, and then you put something hot at the top of the container and then you put something in the container which releases uh, alcohol uh, usually isopropyl alcohol and you're trying to get to a situation where the that creates a cloud of isopropyl particles within the chamber, which then gets super saturated. And it's at the super saturated uh, point that if a muon comes through, then just like a contrail in uh, in the sky produced when a plane goes past, you actually get a trail that goes through. And certainly on YouTube, you can see many videos where people have got this working very effectively. And this is the actual plan. In this case, they use dry ice. Uh, dry ice is a bit difficult for me to access, which is what I was trying to do it this way. Um, and then warm water at the top with it. They showed a sponge here. I used a bit of uh, a bit of felt to put the pro the alcohol in, and then a, 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 a flashlight from the side to show it up. So this is not me. This is just uh, somebody showing an, a, a rather effective cloud chamber and the type of uh, traces you might be able to see. In this case, they've thrown a load of radon gas in to obviously give an awful lot of traces. This is a more amateur uh, version at it, but again, showing some uh, the sort of things that you might be able to see. Um, as I say, I haven't been very successful yet on that, but I'm still hoping to get this and you can uh, show me what to do. We greatly appreciate. I'm then hoping to be able to uh, build my own neutrino detector. I've got to, I've got to bury down about, about one kilometer to be able to stick my uh, big tub of fluid in first before I do that. Thanks very much indeed. That's me finished.